Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series that's held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. The NBC WSC Climate Change Science and Management webinar series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation and aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on fish and wildlife. I would like to welcome Emily Fort, Data and Information Coordinator for the NCC WSCs, to introduce today's speaker. Emily? Hi, and thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I just want to introduce Polly. She's a research associate in the Department of Geography and a PhD student in environmental science at the University of Idaho. She has a Master's in Wildlife Biology from the University of Montana and a Bachelor's in Wildlife Biology from Colorado State. Currently, she's working on understanding the influences of climate on mountain pine beetle outbreaks and incorporating outbreak potential into ecosystem process models. She's also working with the Forest Service to develop a framework for downscaling regional vulnerability assessments to a local level. So with that, I'll turn it over to Polly. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, and thank you all for tuning in today. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share this research with you. First, I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors, Jeff Hickey at the University of Idaho, Paganish Chrysler with the Forest Service, and Ken Rafa at the University of Wisconsin. And today, I'd like to share our research on climate change, mountain pine beetles, and white bark pine forests of the greater Yellowstone area. For today's webinar, I'll start with an introduction to white bark pine and mountain pine beetles. So after the objectives, we'll a brief description of our methods, then spend more time on our results and some discussion of those results, the conclusions that we're drawing from this research, and then I'll finish with just a one slide summary. So white bark pine is a keystone species in high elevation forests. Western, the Western North America. It can survive in very cold and arid conditions. And once it's established, it then allows other less hardy conifers to establish. It's a very slow growing species, and it allocates a lot of its resources to producing seeds with a very high energy content. And these seeds are an important seasonal food resource for a range of animals including squirrels and quest nutcrackers, grizzly bears, and as I've learned recently, um, our alpine fox also species, which is pine cone species. Currently, white bark pine is declining across much of its range in the western U.S. And the Fish and Wildlife Service has white bark pine listed as warranted for inclusion under the Endangered Species Act, but currently due to funding constraints. And this decline can be attributed to several reasons. One is the occurrence of an introduced pathogen, which is shown in this upper left photo, that's white pine blister rust. And this infects the tree and can, if it gets to the trunk of the tree, can girdle it, interrupting the transport of water and nutrients. Another reason is encroachment from lower elevation conifers that are more shade tolerant and faster growing. And this is primarily a result of fire exclusion policy. And most recently, and perhaps most extensively, white bark pine is declining due to attack by mountain pine beetles. Mountain pine beetles are a native forest insect, but Historically, they've been more common in lower elevation lodgepole pine forests. But recently, there's been a significant, substantial amount of white bark pine mortality from mountain pine beetles. This map Polly? Shows, yeah? All right, sorry to interrupt. Can you get a little bit closer? We have some people that are having some trouble hearing you. OK. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. This is a a map showing forested areas in gray with areas with white bark pine mortality from beetles in red. And the time series along the bottom 
is showing the area with observed mortality in the greater Yellowstone region beginning in 1998 through 2009. And this recent outbreak has affected about 66% of the range of white bark pines in the greater Yellowstone. And the photo on the right, that's what a tree that's been attacked by mountain pine beetles looks like. The needles all turn red as, um, because the tree has died. So I'd like to give you a little bit of um, background on the life cycle of mountain pine beetles. As I said, it's a native insect that has been most common in the lodgepole pine forest. And as adults, the trees, um, the beetles fly to trees where they bore through the bark and they're trying to construct egg galleries to lay their eggs. And as they bore through the bark and begin constructing those galleries, they emit a pheromone, which is a chemical signal to other beetles that says, Come attack this tree. Everybody, concentrate on this tree. Because then a massive attack of, of beetles can overcome the defenses that a tree mounts to prevent that attack. Success, when an attack is successful, the eggs are laid in the galleries. They develop them through the fall into larvae. And come winter, development stops. And they overwinter in, in um, the larval stage. In the spring, as temperatures warm, development resumes again. And then till the following summer when new adults emerge and fly to attack new trees. So a tree that is red this summer was actually killed the previous year. Now there are a couple places in this light cycle where climate plays a really important role. And first, adaptive seasonality. This is for the beetles to have a one-year life cycle and to have a synchronous development such that there's a mass emergence of adults in late summer, this is known as adaptive seasonality. And this depends strictly on temperature. Their development rates, each, each life stage has an optimum temperature for development. And so this life cycle is controlled strictly by temperature. Another important point in this life cycle is during the winter. The larvae develop cold hardiness, and um, so there is a, the later, later larval stage are the most cold tolerant, but temperatures low enough can kill even those cold hardened larvae. And so winter beetle mortality becomes important, particularly in these higher elevation white bark pine forests. Then another important place is when the adults are attacking trees. And as I said, the trees have some defensive abilities. They try to literally pitch out the beetles using the, the pine pitch. And this photo is showing a pitch tube on a white bark pine where the, the tree is you know, trying to eject the beetle from it before it can get in and lay its egg galleries. But a tree that is experiencing drought stress then doesn't have as much resource to allocate to defense. It's allocating more of its resources to simply surviving and storing carbohydrates. And so a weakened tree can be successfully attacked and killed by fewer beetles than a healthy tree can. But even a healthy tree can be successfully attacked and killed given a large enough beetle population. And this defensive capability has been fairly well studied in lodgepole pine, but it's thought and initial research has been showing that white bark have a lower defensive capability, although they still obviously do have some ability to defend themselves. And it's thought that they have this lower ability because they've had less interaction with mountain pine beetles through their evolutionary history because they live in the higher elevation, colder places. So, our research objectives, we had three primary objectives. First was to quantify the climate beetle relationships in white bark pine. Second was to understand the causes of the recent outbreak. And third, to estimate the historical trends and future weather suitability for beetle attacks in white bark pine. We divided the range of white bark pine in the western U.S. into three different geographic regions. 
And today I'll be focusing just on the results for the greater Yellowstone area. So to get to objective one, to address objective one, we use statistical modeling to develop the model of the probability of tree mortality given fuel pressure and sand structure conditions and climate conditions. Our response variable is the presence of white bark pine mortality from mountain pine beetles. And this comes from Forest Service aerial detection survey data in which observers and aircraft record the tree species and the mortality agent as they fly regions in the western US. And this has been done in Canada as well. And this was gridded to a one kilometer spatial resolution by Arian Medden and others. For explanatory variables of beetle pressure, we had two variables. One was local beetle pressure, which was the number of trees killed last year within that one kilometer cell. And second was dispersal beetle pressure. That's the number of trees killed last year in a six kilometer radius outside of that focal cell. We wanted to separate the effects of beetles developing locally or those coming in from somewhere else. And these, again, come from the aerial detection survey data. For sand structure, we represented that with the remaining white bark pine. Because we're working at a one kilometer spatial resolution, that equals 100 hectares. So 100 minus the cumulative mortality area since the outbreak began in 1997 gave us an estimate of the potential remaining white bark pine. We also used the percent white bark pine in each grid cell. And this count comes from a 30 meter map of the range of white bark pine developed specifically for the greater Yellowstone area by Lisa Landenberger and others. And finally, we evaluated some data sets that provide estimates of tree biomass and tree diameter or tree size and basal area. But there were too many places where the aerial detection survey indicated a very high number of trees killed. And one or all of these databases had no, no biomass or a diameter of zero indicating it was not forested or a basal area of zero. And therefore, we were unable to include any of these in our analysis, unfortunately. For climate, we represented the process of adaptive seasonality um, with several variables using average fall and spring temperatures. And this comes from 800 meter prism data. We also use the Logan adaptive seasonality probability, which is a model of process model developed to estimate the probability of a one-year life cycle with synchronous development and mass emergence, and several daily temperature metrics that describe length of cold snap and fetal development days similar to growing degree days. And these daily and um, adaptive seasonality probability come from a software, biosim software, along with weather station, daily weather station data. In these variables, we looked at the current year, which would have been um, the winter before the tree was killed, the fall before the tree was killed, and the previous year to capture the possibility of there being a two-year life cycle, not just a one-year life cycle. Fetal winter mortality we re represented with two different variables. The minimum winter temperature, which is the minimum monthly December, January, February temperature, again from PRISM 800 meter data. And cold tolerance, which is another process model that predicts the probability of fuel survival over the winter, which again comes from the biosim modeling framework. And these we also represented with both the current and current and previous year capture this possibility of a two-year life cycle. Tree drought stress, we use water year precipitation, summer precipitation, climatic water deficit, and vapor pressure deficit. And previous research has indicated that there's a, a range of 
timing of drought that can be important affecting tree defensive capabilities. So we included the current through five year lag for each of these variables. And these come from monthly SIVM data. In our model structure, we use a logistic model. It's a binary response to presence or absence of tree mortality. And we use the generalized additive model, which allows for a nonlinear relationship between the explanatory and response variable. And we developed a set of candidate models, each of which had representations of fuel pressure, stand structure, and one variable representing adaptive seasonality, winter mortality, and tree drought stress. Then we used an AIC model selection process on, with this set of candidate models to select the very best model. Then to address objective two and three, which were what were the causes of the recent outbreak and what did historical and what will future weather suitability look like, we took our best model and applied it to historical weather using monthly prism data from 1900 through 2009, and then to future projections. And here we wanted to be sure to capture a range of future possibilities, so we used 10 different general circulation models, or GCMs, under three emission scenarios. These are RCP 2.6, 4.5, and 8.5. These represent low, medium, and high emission scenarios. So after applying the model to these data sets, we then calculated a weather suitability index as the sum of the weather terms in the model. Now, our best model, on to results. Our best model, we retained both the local and dispersal beetle pressure, percent white bark pine representing stand structure. For adaptive seasonality, was best represented by the combination of fall temperature and spring and summer temperature. Fetal winter mortality was best represented by winter minimum temperature. And tree drought stress by the cumulative two year summer precipitation. So we wanted to know well, how well did the model do? And this shows in black the observed area width mortality each year and in red, the predicted area with mortality with the dashed lines, the 95% confidence interval. And so the predictions are, are very similar to the observation. Spatially as well, the predictions are similar to the observations. These maps show the cumulative years with mortality, the light blue being no years, and to the bright pink being up to 11 years with mortality. And again, we felt the model did quite well capturing the temporal and spatial, spatial variability. So we were, felt we could move on to address objective one, which is what are the climate beetle relationships in white bark time? So each of these next slides will have the line graph on the top, which describes the relationship between the variable and the probability of tree mortality, and the histogram on the bottom showing you the distribution of that variable in the input data. So here on the left is fall temperature. And if fall temperature is increasing on the x-axis from left to right, the probability of tree mortality is increasing very steeply. And here, this is probably the um, portraying synchrony that allowing the, the eggs that are developed at different, different weeks, different days in the summer, are all developing until they're reaching that most cold hardy larval stage before winter. And so their survival is, is greater, their synchrony is greater, therefore the probability of tree mortality, their ability to kill trees is greater. Up until it plateaus when further increases in temperature really have no effect. They've all reached the ideal development stage. On the right is um, the effect of April through August temperature. And it's showing a similar response, but you see the, the solid line in the middle is the average response, and the dashed lines are the 95% confidence interval. And we can see that these confidence intervals are very wide for April through August temperature, and they bound zero across most, most of the range. 
And therefore, what that's saying is, given the data that we have to work with, we really can't say anything conclusive about the effect of temperature in the summer. Moving next to fetal winter mortality. As winter minimum temperature increases on the x-axis from left to right, fetal survival is increasing, and not being killed by the very cold temperatures. And therefore, the probability of tree mortality is also increasing. More beetles survive the winter to then emerge the following summer and attack trees, which, is, which they then kill. And again, this is showing a plateau effect, where uh, enough of the population has survived when you get above approximately minus 14 or 13 degrees Celsius, but it's not increasing uh, the tree mortality anymore. Enough has survived. Finally, looking at the relationship to drought stress, this one is a, the axes are, the axis is precipitation. So as precipitation increases from left to right, drought stress is increasing in the opposite direction. So a decline in precipitation moving from 800 millimeters back to 300 millimeters, that's an increase in the tree level of drought stress. And as trees are stressed, the probability of mortality is increasing because they have less resources to defend themselves, to allocate to um, producing pitch to get rid of the beetles. Then you'll notice um, at the very highest levels of drought stress, or the very lowest levels of precipitation, there's an apparent decline in tree mortality. Although so again, the confidence intervals are so wide, we can't see anything conclusive here. But I can offer a couple of um, potential explanations. One is that as trees become severely drought stressed and their tissues dry out, they don't provide very good food for beetles. The eggs that are laid um, simply don't have enough to eat and start to death don't develop into new beetles to hatch and attack new trees. Another possibility is that is a, is a geographic explanation. All of the places in this region that have these lowest levels of precipitation are in the Southern Wind River Range, which is a part of the study area that receives the least amount of precipitation. And it's also the part of the study area that is quite cold and has seen the least amount of beetle attacks over the year, over the, over the recent decades. So again, we can't be saying anything conclusive about the very highest levels of drought stress. Now I want to move to our second and third objectives, which were what caused this recent outbreak and what, what, is, what did the past Look like and what does the future look? What does the future look like? And to do this again, we'll be looking at the weather suitability index that we're calculating after we apply the model to the historic and the future climate data. So this is a look at weather suitability from 1900 through 2009, and the light gray line shows the outbreak area, so you can get a sense for when this recent outbreak began. And Throughout the past century, there has been a lot of fluctuation. There's been some years of above zero, which is suitable for attacks. And there's been quite a few years of below zero, which is unsuitable for attacks. And this red dashed line there indicates the minimum suitability observed during the recent outbreak. And what we see is that once the outbreak began, the weather was consistently suitable. There's one year where the this is an an average of all of those one kilometer pixels within the greater Yellowstone for each year. So there was one year where the average dipped below, below zero. And also, the area with mortality declined in that year, but it wasn't enough to end the outbreak. If we look more closely at this, these colors now represent each of those three important variables, winter minimum temperature, in blue, fall temperature in orange, and summer precipitation in green. And what is really noticeable is there's a lack of cold winters during the recent outbreak. 
Throughout the previous century, there are periods where you see the blue line dipping very low and indicating here that's a cold winter. The temperature was cold enough to kill even the cold hardiest fields. And so that was preventing outbreaks from really getting going, preventing the beetle population from really getting established. But beginning about two years before this outbreak really took off, winter temperatures became suitable, and they remained suitable through the, for the duration of the outbreak. And then in 2000, when the outbreak was really um, increasing in area, there was a co-occurrence of not only a lack of cold winters, but also a summer drought. This is looking at the spatial variability and weather suitability across the region and mapping the number of cumulative years with suitable weather conditions, where the blue being no years of suitable weather, through red being up to 10 years. And this is based on prism data from 2000 through 2009 for the range of white bark pine. And for those familiar with this area, you'll, you'll notice that this is more, this looks like more than the range of white bark pine. Um, I just did that so that the colors, the distinction in the colors show up better. And what we see is that there are some places, um, particularly in the, um, the upper right, the northeast corner of the study area, that patch of blue is the Bear Tooth Plateau, which is a high elevation, particularly cold place. The, in the lower right, the southeast portion of the study area, those are the Wind River Range jutting out. And again, the unsuitable places are again falling out as but mostly the high elevation parts, parts of the study area. So the future, what, what does the future hold? This, I'll take a minute to walk through. There are three, the upper panel is future winter minimum temperature projections, the middle future fall temperature, and the bottom future precipitation projections. The left hand column is RCP 2.6, the low emission scenario, middle column RCP 4.5, the middle emission scenario, the right hand column high emission. The black line is the average over the greater Yellowstone for the prism historical data. The solid darker gray line is the average of the 10 GCMs that we were using. And the lighter gray polygon shading is the range bounded by those 10 GCMs. And so what we can see is that future warming is occurring. Future warming is um, the model degree on future warming in fall and winter, particularly under the higher emission scenarios and particularly later into the century. Future precipitation, however, is less certain. The GCMs don't all agree on what precipitation um, will look like in the future, although it does appear to be mostly within the range of variability. So we want to then, we have then applied our model to these data, okay, so what will future weather suitability look like? This is um, top panel, low emissions, middle panel, medium, medium emissions, and bottom panel, high emissions scenarios. Again, with the solid black, the historical prism data the average of the GCM and the shading, the bounding of the GCM. And I've indicated here with the red box the recent outbreak, so you have a, a sense of where that, um, what the weather suitability looked like in the historical period, the outbreak period into the future. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, is that uh, weather suitability for attacks is increasing, again, as under higher emission scenarios and later into the future. But we also want to look a little more closely here. And now we're looking again, top panel is winter minimum temperature, middle panel fall temperature, bottom panel precipitation. The y-axis is weather suitability now for the three emission scenarios. And we're seeing that there, is, there are still some years with low winter suitability, even under RCP 8.5 and later in the century. Fall temperature is not having any limiting effect into the future. It's all become 
suitable so that all temperatures will be allowing for fields to develop into a synchronous mass emergence for the following summer. And we're seeing a, very, a lot of variability in effective precipitation. And this, I would add, is also the variable that we're the least, the least certain of its effect. There's, this is the one that I think needs more, more research done on it. There are a couple of reasons why precipitation could be having an effect on mortality, not only for tree defenses, but the, it could be an effect of the pheromone signaling and the trees themselves emit chemicals when they're in drought stress that are similar to the pheromone signals that the beetles emit. So I would just point out that there's still a lot of uncertainty in the effect of precipitation. But there's, very, there's less uncertainty in the effect of temperature. And we're seeing that as temperature increases, that is just increasing the suitability for beetles to exist in these forests. But there, there still is a chance for unsuitably cold winters. That's what, when we were looking at the historic weather suitability, that was the most noticeable change, was that the lack of cold winters was the, the big difference between the recent outbreak and previous, the previous century, in which there had been several other smaller outbreaks in white bark pine. But unfortunately, that the probability of unsuitably cold winters that kill a large part of the beetle population is really declining under all emission scenarios in the future. And we looked at the Veracruz Plateau, that that is a place that has been very unsuitable for beetle activity in the last decade. But just a few weeks ago, we were there seeing, looking around at what was happening. And these red trees that you see in the photo have, under their bark, these developing beetles that will emerge later this summer to fly to attack new trees. So I wouldn't classify this as outbreak conditions, but it, it's persistent, low-level beetle activity, even in this place that um, from the modeling is the least suitable place for beetles. So a few things. Um, of course, every bit of research has its caveat, and ours does as well. And the first is that this is we are relying on aerial survey data. And there's certainly the potential for error when people in airplanes are mapping tree species and mortality agents. There's always the potential for spatial errors for misidentifying tree species. Another um, missing piece of the puzzle is this lack of meaningful stem structure data. In previous work, in both lodgepole pine and white bark pine has shown that beetles prefer and select larger trees. And we just didn't have the data available to be able to include that. But I will say that we did include a very fine-grained spatial term, which was trying to account for variability on the landscape that could be due to structure. And including that didn't at, at all influence our interpretation of the climate beetle relationship that I've just presented. So I think even if we can include structure, and it is important, I, I don't think it will influence our interpretation of the climate beetle relationship. So some conclusions and implications that this has led us to, and, and one is concerning the persistence of white bark pine on this landscape. And I think this will largely be determined by this intersection of the pine to cone bearing age and the time between cold winters. Even in places that have experienced heavy mortality, there are still medium-sized and certainly small regeneration-sized white bark pines. And so persistence then becomes this trade-off between how long does it take the tree, the tree, remaining trees to grow to produce cones, 
And how often can we expect there to be a severely cold winter that will knock back the beetle population? As well, of course, as what's the spread of blister rust and encroachment from other conifers? What, how are those factors influenced in tree survival? So there are some planting efforts currently going on where people are, are planting out blister rust resistant seedlings in hopes that because some of the trees, genetic, there are gen enough genetic differences that some trees are showing resistance to blister rust, which is a really great thing. And we would um, recommend that these planting efforts focus on high elevation areas, places that experience cold air drainage, wherever the places on the landscape that are the most likely to experience cold winters to give those trees the, the most time to grow and reach cone bearing age before a beetle attack can come and kill most of them. And we as a, a, excuse me, a global community, I think we need to work to reduce global carbon emissions. This RCP 2.6, which is a reduction from current emissions, is, is the best brightest possible future for the persistence of white bark pine on this landscape. And I recently heard uh, Tara Pike from Climate Access say that we need to, we're not preaching to the choir, we need to make sure the choir is singing. So in summary then, we've seen that white bark pine tree mortality from beetle attacks increases with both higher fall and winter temperatures and increasing summer droughts. And the recent outbreak was initiated by the combination of warm winters and summer drought. And this lack of cold winters is the most noticeable change over the last century. And future weather suitability for beetle packs is unfortunately mostly higher. There are some projections with reduced suitability, and those are from DCM and emission scenarios with greater precipitation. And the trend of Fewer cold winters is only increasing in the future. And therefore, we really would suggest that um, restoration and planting efforts focus on those places that have the best chance of experiencing cold winter in the future. I'd like to thank our funders, particularly the Northwest Climate Science Center. Thanks also to our scientific advisory committee, and particularly to Ari and Medden. And thank you all for your interest and um, participation today. Um, we did have a question early on on, I think, your first map that was the red and gray. And it was, um, why was California left off? Yeah, um, California was left off because the aerial detection survey there is very spotty. They can't fly everywhere every year, and California just doesn't have very good coverage, and so there, there just isn't enough data to do this um, across the whole Sierra Nevada. And also I'll say that in our modeling, anywhere that was not flown, was excluded from our analysis. We didn't assume no mortality just because there were no flights. We excluded it. Thank you. We have a question from Darren, and it says um, he was just making sure that he heard you correctly, that some beetles have a two-year life cycle. And if that is what you said, what's the difference between the one-year and the two-year life cycle populations? The, the beetles, they, they can have a two-year life cycle, particularly in, in colder environments because their development is controlled by temperature, and so it may take two years for enough heat to be accumulated for them to develop into adults. And when that happens, that just increases the chances that the beetles will die before they reach adulthood. They have to overwinter twice instead of just once. And when that happens, it, it leads to um, usually a lower beetle population. And 
So we were including that in the model to see if in this area would they, did it appear they were functioning on a one-year life cycle or a two-year life cycle. And it, it, it was overwhelmingly apparent they were functioning on a one-year life cycle. Thank you. Um, question from Dave, and it says, could you contrast the MPB outbreak thresholds and behavior in the white bark pine versus the lodge pole pine? Yeah, that's an interesting distinction. And this is the part where the drought, drought stress is so interesting because what's been shown, there's been a lot of work um, done on mountain pine beetle outbreaks and lodge pole pine. And that work has shown that there's, there's this interaction between beetle population and drought stress. And when beetle populations are low and trees are stressed, the beetles are able to kill the tree. But then as the beetle population grows, drought stress becomes less important and beetles can kill even healthy trees. But in the white bark pine, we looked at an interaction between the beetle pressure last year the number of trees killed last year and drought stress. And we didn't see any differences in the effects of drought stress at low populations and at high populations. And that's another indication that we just don't yet understand the role of drought stress in white bark pine. Is it primarily affecting tree defenses? Or is it affecting these the chemical production that the, the trees and are producing chemical signals that are similar to the beetle communication signals. So we really don't have a clear picture of this yet. And another question from David, and it says, can these findings be extended to other high altitude pine species in the West? Well, we're, we're trying to extend this through the Northern Rockies and the Cascades, but what we're finding is that even for the white bark pine modeling, the models just aren't performing as well in these other regions. And I think that's probably because of the way white bark pine grows um, in other areas. In the greater Yellowstone, there are lots of stands of trees that are mostly white bark pine. But in the Cascades um, and in the Northern Rockies, there's more of an intermixing of tree species. And in the Northern Rockies, there's also been a lot of mortality from blister rust. And so knowing exactly when you're working at a one kilometer spatial resolution, how much of that really is white bark pine is really hard to say. And so right now, it's not clear to me if the relationships are all that different or the data is just not as, as robust to, uh, to be able to identify those relationships. Um, so as of yet, I'm sorry, I don't have a very clear answer for that. Although it's the same, it is still winter mortality and drought stress that are summer, summer precipitation influence on drought stress that are coming out as the top variables. So we are seeing some similarities, just the models aren't as good. Um, Polly, is it OK if people contact you with any additional questions they may have? Yes, certainly. And um, our, my email is at the bottom of the screen, p-b-u-o-t-t-e at uidaho.edu. And certainly, feel free. Thank you very much, Polly. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.